printing. Uh, we spend a lot of time on internet footprinting. We invest a lot of energy into it. Um, and I'm hoping that with the first few slides of this presentation, um, I'll be able to convey to you some of that excitement and, and bring across uh, some of the reasons why I think uh, that whole process is important. Um, I'll be covering very briefly a footprinting methodology. I uh, won't be going into it in detail. Um, I'll be here that, if you're interested in that, you should attend uh, one of our classes. And then what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at a, um, a set of tools called the wild tools that we've been working on. Uh, the bio tools are kind of a work in progress um, and the, the thinking behind them is to see whether and to what degree we can automate the footprinting process. So what we're hoping to do is to come to a point one day where we'll be able to give someone a web interface or a, a GUI interface where they push a button um, and enter some parameters and that the whole footprinting process is completed for them. And in a minute I'll be talking about some of the applications for a tool like that. I wonder, um, there's a lot of feedback here. If I move, does it get better? No? Yes? All right. Uh, just a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is, um, is Charles. I work for a company called SensePost. Uh, SensePost is a South African company. Uh, so we've come quite a long way, not as long as some of you, but longer than others. Um, and we're a small company, we're about 10 people, of which about nine or, um, or eight are, are technical consultants. And essentially what we do are um, security assessments, primarily in the internet space. Um, we also do a little bit of uh, teaching and speaking like this, and we do a little bit of consulting. Um, but essentially what we spend probably 60 or 70 percent of our time on is performing internet security assessments for companies. Uh, we do that worldwide. About half of our business we do in South Africa, and about half of it we do um, in other parts of the world, Europe, America, and a little bit in Asia. Um, <coughs> the reason we get excited about footprinting and the, and the objective of this presentation is that we found in our work that probably we end up spending about 60, maybe not 70, but 50 or 60 percent of our time uh, with a process we call footprinting. So uh, given an assessment that's going to take, say, two or three weeks, we'll probably spend, at the very least, the first week um, in a passive footprinting process. And then we spend about the first week just trying to understand the target that we're supposed to be attacking. Um, and we make a point of it, if customers come to us and say, um, you know, we'd like to do an assessment on the follow-up IP addresses, we make a point of trying to convince them not to take that approach, but rather to let us do a, to go through the footprinting process and come back to them with the list of IP addresses um, which we think uh, need to be assessed. Um, and as we've gone through the process of, of building these automated tools, we've managed to uh, reduce the time that we need to spend on that process um, probably by about a factor of two already. So something that would have taken two weeks previously, we can now do with these automated tools probably in about a week. Um, and I suspect that we will improve our accuracy um, probably by about a factor of 50%. Because we're no longer making mistakes that come from human error. So why are we excited about um, footprinting? Well, the first reason that we're excited about footprinting is because we live in the real world. What I mean by that is that when we attack, when, <clears throat> when I want to attack something, if I'm a hacker and I want to attack something, or if I'm a consultant and I want to do an assessment, I'm doing that attack on a real world entity. But I'm interested in attacking Coca-Cola or Citibank. Don't attack Coca-Cola or Citibank. But um, that's typically what I would be looking at. Um, I'm not interested in attacking this IP address or that IP address. In the end, I'm going to be attacking them. Um, but that's more a, a, a consequence of what it is that I actually set out to do. Right? And so um, I'm looking for a way that I can map this real-world entity, this thing that is Coca-Cola or Citibank or the American government, um, or even maybe something like the pharmaceutical industry in Brazil, right? or maybe Kuwait, and I want to be able to map that to actual physical IP addresses that I can end up attacking. And that process is far from trivial. Right? You can't go to a map and say, well, show me all the IP addresses in Kuwait. Sorry, you can, you can possibly go to a map and do that, but you can go to a map and say, show me all the IP addresses that are relevant to Kuwait. Uh, and that's where the process starts to be interesting. So uh, we live in the real world. 
Secondly, uh, we need a place to start. Right? The, we need a place to start. The relationships between entities in cyberspace are often not as obvious as the relationships between entities in the real world. Right? Um, if I, uh, if I want to attack uh, Coca-Cola, um, uh, one obvious place would be uh, to start at Coke.com. Um, but what about Coca-Cola.com? Uh, what about Coca-Cola.co.za? Uh, what about the service providers Coca-Cola.com, the web hosting company, the DNS hosting companies? Uh, what about the people who design and manage their websites? Uh, what about subsidiaries of Coca-Cola, bottling companies? Uh, guys that do um, research and development. Um, what about the owners of Coca-Cola? All of those companies um, may be interesting to us if we want to attack Coke. And so we want a place to start to try and map out these relationships, and not only in the real world, but also in, in the cyber world. And thirdly, footprinting is interesting to us because uh, we've come to the conclusion over the last few years that security is increasingly becoming about the where and not the what. Uh, I say this often. <clears throat> the reason we say this is because the, the level of sophistication of the, of the network security guy, the firewall administrator, of your security officer, is growing. The guys are becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, so people now know, if you come to a conference like this, people now know, I need to have a decent firewall, and I need to have, my firewall needs to have certain characteristics. I need to have a specific network architecture, right, that gives me isolation and, and um, what do you call that? Containment, a DMZ or a glass house, that sort of thing. And I need to have zones where I keep my infrastructure of higher levels of criticality and lower levels of criticality. I need to have um, some basic things like virus scanners, content level checking. Um, I need to have, um, I was going to have IDSs maybe. I need to install uh, my service packs. Administrators know all these things, right? And at most companies with a relatively high level of tech, technological sophistication, those things are going to be happening, right? They're going to be done. If your web server is going to be patched, your firewall is going to be up to date. Uh, these things are all in place. So um, if I'm looking to attack a company, I'm not going to want to spend a lot of time where these things are being done right. What I want to do is I want to identify that place in the infrastructure um, where these things are being done wrong. I'm looking for that single place in the entire space where someone has missed something. So it's less about finding the single bug on a given machine and more about finding that machine where there is a bug. Right, does that make sense? Uh, the analogy just made me labor that point for two more minutes. The analogy that we use is if you wanted to break into someone's house, I come from South Africa, we're all paranoid. Right? Um, so if you look at an average guy's house in South Africa, you'll have like a six or a seven foot or an eight foot wall. On top of which you'll have like another three feet of electric fencing. You'll have two rock violas that stand to about up to here. Um, and you'll carry a gun, right? So um, if you want to break into his house, you're not going to spend a lot of time trying to break down his front door. Right? It would be done and you're likely to get shot. But what you may do is stand back a little bit and observe his behavior. And you'll soon find out that the man is married, right? If you observe his behavior a little bit longer, uh, you'll find out that um, his wife has a job, and every day they both go to work, and his wife goes to her place of work, and he goes to his place of work. And if you observe his wife, you'll find that every day between 12 and 2, she goes to lunch with her friends. And when she goes to lunch, she leaves her keys in the drawer at the office. Um, and it may be really easy for us to walk into the office, which is a big, busy public place, take the keys out of the drawer, and then let ourselves into his house so we can steal his car. Right? Much easier than trying to hammer our way through his front door. And that's why we say it's about the where we want to do the equivalent in cyberspace. We want to find that one place where someone left their keys lying around. Um, because that's going to be the way we're going to end up getting into his network so we can steal his car. Don't steal people's cars. It's bad. All right, there's some other reasons to get excited. Um, from the security administrator's point of view, he wants to know where his perimeter lies. Right? Well, she wants to know where her perimeter lies. She wants to know what is it that I actually have to defend. And again, it's not so trivial. Um, it's not just a question of defending www.mycompany.com. It's a question of defending um, your DNS service, right? your backup mail exchanges, um, the IP address of the guy who's allowed to connect to your website for updates, etc., etc. 
Um, and, and we've seen in large companies that have an international presence, if you go through this process comprehensively, you may end up with a list in excess of 1,000 or even 1,500 internet-facing IP addresses that are relevant to the security of your company that you have to be concerned about. So we can effectively do a footprinting process quickly and automatically to a very, very useful tool for administrators to say, so what is it that I should actually be looking at? What have I missed? Um, so that as an aside, we've noticed that marketing people are interested in this kind of process. On the web, it's very hard to know what your footprint looks like. Uh, people want to know, uh, what domains do I have? How do those domains represent me? On which web servers um, do, those, do the sites for those domains lie? Um, <clears throat> for example, one of the um, applications that we've been approached about for this kind of technology is by banks that want to see whether their brand is being abused in um, attempted fraud cases. Uh, you all heard of these Nigerian fraud cases where the guys made and offer you $20 million for helping them out. You know that? Anyone seen that? I saw it in the news last night. CNN reckons that uh, this year, so far this year in the States, $3 million US million has been lost. In America, only um, on cases like that. When Nigerian guys convince you to give them huge amounts of money using email, and it's ridiculous. Um, if you, yeah. Um, and the, the banks are interested, and, and so what, what these guys now do is, is a part of their fault, they create like look-alike websites, like look-alike brands. So there'll be a bank called a Trusted Bank in South Africa. They've got a website called trustedbank.com. And these, uh, these fraudsters will create a domain called trustedbankonline.com. And they'll literally um, copy the brand of Trusted Bank, and then they'll use this website to um, to, to add credibility to their fraud scheme and try and lead you astray. So um, there's been an interest from, from like banks and financial institutions to see whether they can do this process quickly and effectively in the hope of picking up data. So to say, well, I know about these sites and these domains and this is how they look today, but look, tomorrow, um, suddenly there's another site in a similar domain that's actually not mine. I mean, they can pick up these kinds of um, fraud cases. We don't know yet if we're really going to be able to do it, but that's the sort of thing we're looking at. And finally, this is uh, my colleague Neil, who, who works on this. This is what really turned him on. <clears throat> he thinks that if we can do this effectively, we may be able to do um, targeted cyber terrorism. Like we may be able to build the cyber equivalent of a weapon of mass destruction. So you may be able to say, I want to target all the IP infrastructure that's relevant to whatever. Um, no, not sense post. Um, that's relevant to Israel. Right, we want to target all the IP infrastructure that's relevant to Israel. You put in Israel, you run a program, and it comes back and says, if you want to do damage to Israel, uh, these would be the IP addresses that you need to attack. Um, or maybe we could do it a little bit more uh, fine-grained and say, uh, we want to do damage to the oil industry in um, West Africa and Nigeria. We want to do damage to the oil industry. We could go out and find out all the IP addresses that are relevant and used by all companies in Nigeria. Um, or we can do it for a specific company and say, show us all the IP addresses that are relevant to SensePost. Um, and if you think about, for example, I don't know if any of you saw our talk that we did on um, Trojan technology last year, Black Hat? No? Uh, we did a talk on a Trojan that we developed called Satiri. Uh, that's essentially a remote controllable and invisible, uh, no matter where it lies on the, in, on the network. So even in a hostile environment, so for example, you, put the, you get the Trojan loaded on someone's um, PC and it's sitting on a non-rooted network and they've got uh, personal firewalls, they've got IDS, they've got uh, authenticated proxies, um, they've got all of that stuff, we can still communicate with and control our Trojan. Uh, no matter how hard you try to protect your private network, once we've got our Trojan on your machine, your machine essentially belongs to us. So interactively we can make it do things and send out for that. So if, for example, if I could use a process like this, to um, extract email addresses, I can say, derive from all the email addresses that are relevant to the pharmaceutical industry in uh, Germany, comes back with a whole lot of email addresses, I deliver my Trojan to those email addresses, and now I can start to really effectively attack a specific segment of a specific industry in a specific country. Um, again, I think we're still quite far from there, but that's one of the things we're thinking about. All right, so let's look at the whole um, footprinting process, just at a, at a, at a high level. I'm going to sort of use a, a military analogy. We break the footprinting process up into these four phases. We start off with uh, what we call intelligence. Intelligence, the objective intelligence is to derive DNS domains. OK? 
take my time here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What time do I have to end? Eleven twenty-five. Jesus, it's like an hour away. Okay. I'm gonna talk very, very slowly. Um. <laughs> Right, so uh, we we'll break it up into these the footprint because of these four phases. Intelligence is about getting DNS domains. Right? We sort of we want to get a whole list of DNS domains that are relevant to the company that we're targeting. And not only DNS domains necessarily that are directly relevant, like brands where they have their own websites, but also DNS domains that maybe have slightly more obscure relationships with them, like subsidiaries, like holding companies, like business partners, like service providers, etc. We want to have an extent, as extensive as possible list of domains that could possibly be relevant to the guys that we're attacking. What we then do is we say, let's take these domains and map them to a list of IP addresses. And the primary mechanism for doing that is obvious, it's DNS. Like once we've got a domain, we can do a zillion different kinds of DNS queries, and every one of those DNS queries is going to pop up an IP address. And the IP address is a potential target, something that we could eventually possibly hit. Alright, um, and what we do there, I explained it to the guys in our, in our class yesterday, is, in, is, is doing that process, in a process of mapping um, the DNS domains to the IP addresses, we make the assumption that if a particular organization is using an IP address, in a, a single IP address in one space, it's very likely that they're also using additional IP addresses in that same space, some of which may not have DNS names. Right, makes sense? So if uh, www.sensepost.com maps to 10.10.10.5, um, .10 um, even if we have no other DNS names that map to the 10.10.10 .10 range, uh, we're going to make the assumption that there may be other addresses in that range that are also being used to the company, by that company, but just don't have names, right? So at this point, we don't actually speak about specific IP addresses, we speak about spaces, typically a class C. Then we go into the verification phase, and the, and, the, and the objective of the verification phase is to avoid collateral damage, as the uh, American military so um, nicely puts it. Then we don't want to break stuff that doesn't belong to the guys that, that we're attacking. Right, so what we want to do there is we want to accurately identify the boundaries of the network. Right, we started off in the previous phase talking about, say, class Cs. And we want to know, are we actually dealing with the class C? Are we dealing with just a single machine that's hosted within a class C? Are we dealing uh, with, say, a, an IP subnet of 32 IPs or 16 IPs that happens to be located within a class C? Or are we dealing just with a machine that's co-hosted on another machine? And so we're, uh, as accurately as possible, we want to identify those boundaries. And once we've identified the boundaries, we want to see, well, within those spaces that we've now identified, how many of those machines are actually active? How many of those machines are actually being used? How many of them can we get some response out of on the internet? Because um, we don't want to waste our bullets. Those are the machines that we're going to end up um, attacking. And so by the end of this process, provided that we do it um, with a little bit of discipline, we can have a list of IP addresses that we know to be active and which we can then use as targets to attack. Um, and then, of course, then you go start doing all the other wonderful stuff that you'll, uh, that you'll hear about at this, at this seminar. And I'm just going to depict that again um, in, a, in a graphical form. So you'll see up on the left there, we start off with the list of all the domains that we want to attack. We use a whole lot of forward and DNS queries and other DNS tricks to, um, to get a list of IP number DNS main mappings, right? Name to IP and IP to name. For every IP address we have there in the right-hand corner, we then uh, expand that to a block of 254 IPs. And then we go through a, a, a process of trying to, as accurately as possible, identify the real borders of that space. So do they really start at 1 and end at 254, or do they maybe start at um, 7 and end at 15? All right, so that's the process that we apply. And this, this process is, is really, very, very effective, um, provided that we can do everything right. Now, those two parts we can do extremely effectively. Uh, we've automated those processes um, and, and really it works like a bomb. Single call, put in the domains on the one side, all the IP addresses will pop out and all the subnets. Uh, where we're not getting it right to date is in those two places. Right? We're not getting it right 
to effectively extract all the various domains that are relevant to a particular organization, and we're still struggling a lot to automatically identify the boundaries of their spaces. And those are sort of the two areas that I want to talk about in this, um, in this talk. And our thinking is that if we can sort those two areas out, then we may be able to completely automate that process to the degree that you type in Coca-Cola in the front and end up with a list of IP addresses at the back. Um, and probably I'm going to spend most of my time on this first one, and if we have some time at the end, um, I'll look a little bit at the other one. All right, so uh, we call it intelligence game, and remember the objective here is to s extract all the domains that we possibly can um, in an automated fashion. And then the, the methodology that, we, um, that, that, we've been, that we've developed looks like one of those little slinky slacks, you know, it goes like in and out, and in and out, and in and out. And the first time we go in and out, we go in and out a lot, we repeat it. The next time we go in and out, we go in and out a little, little, a little less, until eventually the whole thing loses momentum and settles down. And at that point, we say, well, now we've got all the information that we can possibly extract um, online about the company that we're attacking. So we start off with a single domain or a list of domains that we know for sure are related to the company that we want to attack. Okay, that's relatively easy to, to do. You can guess it. So if, like for Coke, you go www.coke.com. See, okay, you've got their website. Uh, you may have someone's email address. Uh, you may have to shop around a little bit uh, to find out uh, you know, what the core domains are that relate to the site that you're attacking. We're going to go through the process of expanding, which I'll talk about in some detail. And we're going to end up with a lot of domains. And when I say a lot of domains, I really mean a lot of domains. Um, and then we're going to go through the process of reducing those domains to, um, to the domains that are really closely linked to, to the site in question. So it's an expand, reduce, expand, reduce, and so it carries on. So the first, um, the first part of the expansion phase is to derive as many domains as we possibly can. And here's the thinking that we apply. Uh, the first thinking is that the internet is full of what we call extended families. Right, and I've mentioned some of that before. Extended families include parents, children, brothers and children, children, brothers and sisters, um, cousins, things like that. So, so we're talking subsidiary companies, um, parent companies, partner companies, service providers, all of that sort of thing. Um, and the way we can find these relationships online is by looking at HTTP links. Right? If I have a link on my site to somebody else, um, that indicates some kind of relationship between me and that other person, or that other site. Okay, at this point, I have no idea what that relationship is, but it indicates some kind of relationship. Um, similarly, if somebody has a link from their site to my site, that indicates some form of relationship between them and me. It may be that they hate me, but they have a link on their site, like check me dumbasses out, and that would have linked to sensepost.com, but that's also a form of relationship, right? Um, in fact, most of my room now, okay. <coughs> well, I can't control who links to me. Right? I can't stop someone from putting a link on their site saying, look at this bunch of losers and uh, putting a link to sensepost.com. I can control who I link to. All right? So from that I deduce that a link from my site to another site is more relevant than a link from another site to me. All right? Um, if I only have one link on my site, and it's to you, that's probably more relevant than if I have a thousand links on my site and you're just one of them. I have an example of a, of a, of a site that's got a thousand links on, on it, it would be like a portal site. And you go to securityfocus.com and you just get thousands and thousands of links to all kinds of uh, security related resources. Now, those are probably not strong relationships. But if you go to, um, I don't know, what is that bank, trustedbank.com, and they have a link to trustedinsurance.co.za, and that's the only other link they have on their site, that probably re re uh, reflects a strong relationship between trusted bank and trusted insurance, okay? And if we have a link to somebody else, and they have a link to us, that probably reflects some kind of relationship. Now that's not always gonna be true, right? But um, it, it makes sense to take a relationship like that and examine it further to see what it really represents. So technically, how do we do that? Well, we start um, by deriving as many core sites as we can, by using uh, common sense and possibly by using whois databases. Get as many core sites as we can. Then we start by exploiting the, the websites of those core domains and doing a search engine. And by exploiting, I don't mean that we hack them, I just mean that we use them extensively. 
So, for example, one of the technologies that we've been considering here is to use the Google API. Like Google gives you a set of libraries that you can use to make specific queries to their site without having to do the whole HTTP, build a header, make the request, pass the output thing, etc. So we use a lot of Google, we can use um, the website. The way we get the data from the website is by using web spidering tools. So for every uh, website that we consider at this point, we're going to make a connection to it, we're going to suck the whole thing down to our server, and then we're going to examine the locally stored data for links. Um, then we're going to use some of the logic that we looked at in the previous section on that uh, top paragraph, and we're going to try and compute a relative importance for every given relationship. Okay, and we do that by looking at two specific factors. The first is we look at the direction. That is the relationship from the core site out, or is the relationship out into the core site? Um, and we experimented there a lot with, with different kinds of uh, weights to, to reflect the relative importance of those two directions. And in the end, we said, well, if uh, there's a link out, we'll give it a, a weight factor of 1. And if there's a weight in, we're going to give it a weight factor of 60%. Okay, so connection in, we consider to be 60% as relevant as a connection out. Now, that's purely dumb site. And we did that really just by experimenting with, um, with sites and domains that we knew and playing with different numbers until the, until the output was accurate. I suspect <coughs> that at some later stage, we'll be able to profile targets and say, this is a commercial organization, this is a non-government organization, this is a government organization, this is an e-commerce type site, etc., and use different ways to more accurately get um, to reflect those relationships. So that's the first factor, we look at the uniqueness, at the direction. And the second factor that we look like at is the uniqueness of the relationship. As I said, if we only have one link out from our site, we consider that relationship um, relevant, extremely relevant. But if there's a thousand links, then we consider each of those relationships relatively um, irrelevant. And we repeat this process twice. Right, so once from the core site out, and once from all of those sites out again. In this examination. Why don't we go further? Because the curve sort of does that very, very quickly. So we get a lot of information with the first iteration. We still get a fair amount of information with the second iteration. By the time we get to the third iteration, when well, we're looking at thousands and thousands of sites um, to start with, and the value that gets added is very, very low. And the two tools that we developed to do this work uh, is a tool called BIO. It stands for Binary Link Extractor and by a way, which does the, the relative way. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you the tools online because of the time it takes to, um, to do this. You, you can imagine that once you start whacking other people's websites down and you're starting to talk about hundreds of sites, um, it takes a very long time. But I'll just give you an idea of how they work. <coughs> Bio allows you to put a single website in and specify an output site. So you uh, typically put in a thing like www.sensepost.com and uh, it's going to end up pushing out a list like this of relationships. Okay? Where a relationship from A to B and a relationship from B to A is considered two different relationships. Okay, you're just going to get a long list of this. And essentially what this list says is that somewhere from A there was a link to B. Somewhere from A there was a link to C. Somewhere from C there was a link to A. Somewhere from C there was a link to B. Okay, and it's just this really, 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 really long list. Um, literally thousands, thousands of entries. And so we looked at that for a long, and then we spent some time looking at ways to graphically depict it. And there's a tool from uh, Kaida.org, C-A-I-D-A.org, um, that, that allows you to do um, graphical depiction of relationship trees. And so if you take a list up there and you put it into a tool, this is what you're going to see. And if you look at the file, it's very difficult. And this in itself is really, really interesting if you're looking at a target. Um, and with this tool, which is really, which is really nice, is you can move the focus. So I can now select any one of those nodes that you see there and click on it, and that node will become the center of my diagram, and I can see then how the relationships move out from that particular node. Um, and what we haven't done, but which is also very easy to do, is you can add auxiliary information. So when I click on a node, I can have the program show me what the address is, um, who, the do, the, who the registered owner is, etc., etc., etc. But if, in effect, in a, in a 2D format, this is what the information that file is going to uh, that Pile is going to show you. It's going to show you this whole web of relationships between different sites on the internet. 
uh, but there's still a, uh, there's a lot of information, and it doesn't show us the relative importance of these relationships. Uh, for example, what you'll see is something like this, is you'll see that we've got a link to adobe.com from our site, right? Because uh, we offer people the Adobe Acrobat Reader for download. And from Adobe, uh, so Adobe becomes one of the relationships, all right? And then you find that all the other sites in our sort of relationship network, a thousand, of them, a thousand other of them also have links to adobe.com. And so if you look at the density of these relationships, um, you'll see suddenly Adobe looks like it's the center of your world because everyone's linking to and from Adobe. You see similar, related, you see similar things happening with sites like Security Focus that are portal sites. Um, so this information at this point can still be a little bit misleading. And that's why we introduced the whole by way concept. So by way, like we said, is to try and use those two weight factors, the direction and the uniqueness, um, to determine the relative importance, relative importance of any other domain to your original domain. Okay, the relative importance of any of the other domains that we've extracted to our original domain. So essentially what we do is push in the name of the original domain, like www.sensepost.com, and we push in the output that we got from the previous phase, which is that whole long list of relationships, um, and we push in the weight factor, like in our case, um, 60%, and we let the whole thing run. And what it's going to do is it's going to put out a list that looks something like, no, I don't have it yet. It's going to push out a list that looks something like, like what you see at the bottom there, where the site that according to our weight factor got the highest relevance is going to end up at the top of your list, and so they go down. You still have the same number of sites, but now essentially they're sorted. I want to spend some time. I want to spend some time just talking about how we do that sorting process because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, again, I think the algorithm that we apply here is not perfect. I, mean, I think it's probably still far from perfect, but it's been a relatively good start. It <coughs> seems to be doing the trick. We start off by assigning our core site in the middle there a um, a seed value, some number. It doesn't really matter what the number is. We found that the number 300 computes very nicely over two iterations. But it doesn't really matter, you could assign it anything. Um, and in this scenario, we've got three links, three other sites involved, right? The red arrows indicate links out to other sites, and the black arrows indicate our links in. So we've got on our website, essentially we've got two links, one going to A and one going to B. Um, B also has a link into us, and C has a link into us, even though we don't have a link to C. That's the sort of typical scenario, but it would be much more complex. Um, let's take one of the simpler cal calculations. Let's take, let's take A. Uh, we take the seed value, 300, right? And we divide it by two, or multiply it by half, because that link out is only one of two links that are out from our site. Okay, so that's the uniqueness factor. We times it by a half. And we times it by a um, direction factor of one because the link is out from us to that site, which gives site A a relative value of, a relative importance value of 150. Uh, site C will work similarly. Again, we times it by a uniqueness factor of a half because there's two links in from other sites to us. Uh, but this time we um, multiply it by a direction factor of 60% because the link is not out from us, but it's in to us, and so it's less important. And B ends up being a combination of that. Right? Uh, the link to B is one of two links out, times by a, a direction factor of one, and the link in from B is one of two links in, times by a direction factor of 60%, and that makes B, gives B the relative importance of 240. And then you can see then how it works out. So we would, in this simple set of relationships, we will consider B the most relative site with a relative weight of 240, uh, A the next most important site with a relative weight of 150, and C the least relevant of those uh, with a factor of 90. And so the process then repeats itself when we go out into an additional level, and again, um, those, those factors get, get calculated, and what you end up with is a list that looks something like this. So this is the raw data from running the site on Black Hat. Black Hat is a bit of a bad example because um, because they're essentially a portal site, right? Uh, they're, not a, they're not a corporation, they're a portal site. But um, it, it does read like a little bit of a who's who of 
of whitehead hate, which I thought was quite interesting that you see since post pops up right at the bottom. Now bear in mind that if you went through this process as a completely blind person, and you didn't know what black hat did before, um, then this is a relatively good list, relatively good indication of who's who in the security industry. You see there's DEFCON right up at the top, one under security focus. Okay, and, the and this example gives us a really good um, indication of how much space, maybe I'll just give you an idea of how much of these domains we're looking at. Um, if we take an average bank, in, let me just think about this now. Oh, if we take this process and we run sense posts through it, we run through sense posts, we're going to end up with a list of about 15,000 domains. Right? 15,000 domains that are linked to us over only two iterations of relationship. If we take an average bank in South Africa, we're going to end up with about, um, we're going to end up with about 150,000 domains. Now, mind you, we're going to end up with 75,000 domains. That's an average bank size, they give about 75,000 domains. And if you take a, a big American government agency, for example, you're going to end up with something in the region of 300,000 domains. Okay? So the, the, the relationships in the internet are extremely robust. And what we now need is we now need a way to take all of those relationships and reduce them to a list that's much more accurate. And so we go through our first um, reduction process. There are obviously too many domains, and we need to bring them down to, uh, to a finite list, right? Um, and the thinking that we apply there is, um, well, there's really three things. It's not well, it's not well reflected on that side. We're going to look at who is information. We're going to say who is the registered owner of this domain, and does it appear to be the same as the registered owner of the original domain? Secondly, we're going to look at um, the website. We're going to say, well, which website address? IP address is used by the website for this domain, and is it perhaps the same as the website that's used? for the original domain, and thirdly we're going to look at mail exchange records. We're going to say, well, is the mail for this domain perhaps going to the same place as the mail for the original domain? And any one of those three things is going to, um, is going to indicate to us that there's a stronger relationship um, between those domains than just what we saw using Minx. <coughs> so there's, a, there's three tools that we designed for this. The first is called uh, Vet IP. Essentially what you do is you push in those list of DNS DNS names, those websites that we put out in the previous phase. Um, you give a file of sites that you know to truly belong to the site that you're considering. Um, so for example, you would have in SensePost case, you put in SensePost.com, SensePost.co.za, HackRack.com, HackRack.co.za. And that's about all. You put in those four sites because you know those are SensePost sites. Uh, you expect an IP file and you give it a sort of a flexibility rating. Um, which indicates how closely to the original site you expect your um, new sites to be. So for example, um, let's say we do a host lookup for www.sensepost.com and we find it sits at 10.10.10.1. Uh, then we have a new domain called um, hackingbynumbers.com, www.hackingbynumbers.com, which we think may have a relationship. We do a lookup for www.hackingbynumbers.com and we find that it sits on 10.10.10.14. Right. It's not exactly the same IP address as the web server for SensePost, but it's within, say, 16. So we can add that factor into this. So we don't just need exact maps, we're just also looking for proximity maps. We, uh, uh, we run it out there, and essentially what it's going to do is it's going to extract in a list, uh, it's going to push out a list of sites that share the same web server IP address, okay, or whose web server IPs are close to your web server IPs. The big danger here, or the big thing where this goes wrong, is when sites are virtually hosted. Um, if you start looking at, say, 15,000 domains, it's very, very likely that two of them, or three of them, or more of them, have their sites hosted on the same virtually hosted machine. Okay, so we register our domain with securityfocus.com, and we host our site there. You also register your domain with um, securityfocus.com, you register your site there. And, and if I've got a link to you on my site, then this dating tool is going to say that you and I have a relationship because we've got links to each other and because we've got the same web server. And that's obviously not necessarily true. But it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, so we look at um, web server. Similarly, we look at um, mail. And this is uh, probably the, the most valuable of these kinds of techniques. We say, well, if the, um, if the mail for 
trackingbynumbers.com goes to the same place as the mail for sensepost.com and that clearly indicates a very strong relationship between hackingbynumbers.com and sensepost.com. And again, we apply exactly the same uh, principles as before. We uh, give a list of the domains that we know to belong to the actual site. We give a list of domains that we extracted through the previous phases. Um, we give it the flexibility rating. It defaults to 32, but you can make it bigger or you can make it smaller. We run the script. It's going to churn out all the MX records for all of those domains, match them to the MX records for the domains that you know do belong to your site, and say to you, these are the guys that match. And then finally, we're going to look at whose information. So for each of the domains that we found, we're going to attempt to extract um, whose data for that domain. And then we're going to look at key elements of that whose data. So not just necessarily <coughs> who the actual registered owner of the domain is, but um, also things like, what's the email address of the technical contact? Uh, what are the last four digits of the fax number that's given for administrative contact, etc.? Because very often we find domains are registered in one case to ABC Co. Um, and the next case to ABC Inc. And the next case to Amalgamated Brewing Company. And <clears throat> so with the, with the eye, you'd see that there's a relationship. But it's very hard for an automated process to pick that relationship up. Um, and the big tool that we use there is the Deep Tools Proxy by Rob Ballard, which you get at deeptools.com, which is really, really powerful. Um, who is is really, really challenging from that point of view for a number of reasons. The first reason who is is challenging is because there's no definitive resource for who is information. It's not one place that you can go on the internet and say who is X, Y, Z. And not only are there different who is registrars for different uh, top level domains, here at UK, here at ZA, etc. But even for single top level domains like .com, there are now multiple registrars. Okay, so certain, um, certain companies are going to register their .com with register.com. Other companies are going to register their .com with Verisign, etc. So it's very hard for us to determine where to get the registration information from. And the other thing that's really hard for us to determine is what the format of the registration information is. Now, who is always puts its data out in a flat file format, right? Yeah. It pushes like a file out that they say um, that's human readable. And because it's human readable, it's almost impossible for a uh, automated process to automatically parse it and pull out the relevant information. So it's tra challenging. And the third reason why it's challenging is because these guys protect their resources. Right, you go to a place like um, www.whois.net, which also offers you a Whois proxy that you can do this sort of thing with. And um, <coughs> you start making multiple queries, right? Who is X, who is Y, who is Z, and carry on. And it works fine for like the first 100 queries. And after 100 queries, they start to slow you down, and slow you down, and slow you down. And eventually, your queries only coming back like one every five minutes. And then what they do is they start to inject random data. And so they say, oh yeah, we've got to who is the xyz.com. And it just doesn't exist at all. I'm just making it up. Um, so it's, it's very hard for us to, to definitively extract this information. One of the techniques that we've started applying is that um, we, use, we do all our who's lookups now through a single set of libraries. And every time we have a successful extraction of Whois data, we store it to our own database. Um, in the hope that in the future, we won't have to send these queries out the net anymore. We'll be able to resolve them locally first. Alrighty. Okay, so now we've taken that whole big list of domains. We literally said thousand, uh, there are many thousands, and we reduced them using Whois netting, uh, mail exchange record netting, and web server IP address netting to a finite list which is much, much smaller Right, we started wide, we've squashed it in, and we're going to do one more expansion. And that expansion we do using um, uh, two assumptions. The first assumption is that if the company that we're looking at is called, um, has a site called coke.com, right, they may also have a site called cokeonline.com, um, cokeisgood.com, um, the coca-cola-tour.com, uh, coca-cola-mtv.com. Whatever. So there may be various permutations of that keyword that we discovered in previous domains that we want to look at. Um, and the tool we use for that is uh, Whois Expansion. So we're going to try and do Whois Brute Force Lookups. And some of the Whois servers are going to allow us to do that automatically. But you go to uh, VeriSign's Whois server and you say Whois star send star and you'll get a list of all the registered domains that contain the keyword Star. Ah, uh, star. That contains the keyword sense. Alright? With two restrictions. Uh, the first is that rate limiting that I told you about. Um, and 
the second is that you obviously have to find the relevant Google server for that domain. Okay, so it doesn't help just going to one Google server, you have to go to VeriSign, you have to go to um, register.com, etc., etc., etc. Uh, some of them don't allow uh, expansion at all, in which case we're just stuck. There's nothing we can do. Um, the other thing that they do is they do this whole rate limiting thing, and oftentimes what they do is they limit the amount of output that you can get at any given query. So we'll do a Google's lookup for star send star, and it'll say, yes, there's 2,600 records, uh, here are 50. And that's the only 50 we're ever going to get. And so with these um, brute forcing mechanisms, what we have to do is we have to build iterative views. So instead of just searching for sense, we end up searching for sense A and seeing if we get less than 50 replies. If we still get more than 50, we look for sense AA. If we still get more than 50, we look for sense AAA. Right, until we only get 50 replies. And then we say, okay, well, let's see what's for sense AAB, what's for sense AAC. And we've got all of those, we go to what's for sense AB, sense ABA, and so we can, and it takes hours and hours and hours and hours. But eventually, uh, if we're patient enough, we'll be able to extract all the domains that appear to have been an expansion of the original key term that we found. The tool that we've got for that is a tool called Expand Who Is, and that's exactly what it does. Um, and then the final form of um, expansion that we have is what we call TLD expansion, top level domain expansion. And the thinking behind that is that if uh, I've got a domain registered like www.sensepost.com, um, it's very likely that I may have a domain like www.sensepost.co.uk or www.sensepost.ie or something like that. So for all of the domains that I've now definitively identified in the previous phases, I just go through and I check are there any domains in other top level domains uh, of the same name. And that's a relatively easy process. We extract a list of all the top level domains, uh, we loop through it, and for every uh, one that we find, we do a name server lookup to see if there's a registered name server for that domain. If there's a registered name server for that domain, then we say, okay, uh, that domain is obviously been registered, it's something that we need to look at. Uh, there's two challenges in doing that. Uh, the one is that um, the different top level domains handle their hierarchies in different ways. So for example, if you want to look at all the uh, domains in the .za space, you, you can't just look at sensepost.za, you have to look at sensepost.co.za, sensepost.ac.za, sensepost. Um, what else is there? ac, gov.za, etc. Um, and other top level domains will do it differently. So for example, in Malaysia, they won't say um, sensepost.co.my, they'll say sensepost.com.my. And so we've had to build tables of how these different um, top level domain suffixes hang together so we can move through them effectively. That's the first challenge. The second challenge are these guys, these, um, what would you call them, these commercial top level domain registrars, like .tv and .nu and .to. Right? These are guys that um, are trying to sell you top level domains, um, some domains in their top level space, uh, commercially as a business, that's what they do. Trying to make money out of you by convincing you by a .tv domain. So what happens is you go www. any domain in the whole world .tv and you always hit this site. Okay, you go host minus tmx any domain in the whole world .tv and you always get the same mx record. All right. So it's impossible. Or it's very difficult for us to automatically determine where the sense post .tv um, really is a domain that's being used or whether it's uh, one of these domains. And so what we've done is we've built a thing that we call, um, I forget its name, that we call it VetTLD. And what VetTLD does is it attempts to build a database of known template sites. We refer to this here as a template site. Okay? And we built a little database where we fingerprint uh, these sites, the, uh, the web server IP address, and the mail exchanger IP address. And we say we keep it in a database. And so every time we find something, uh, like sensepost.tv, we compare it to fingerprints that we've kept in the databases, and the database of sites that we know to be templates. Um, and if we know it to be a template, then we can, then we can throw it away. And uh, that's where we end up discarding all of this junk. Uh, the problem with that is, of course, that it takes very, very long. So we don't build the templates in real time. What we do is we run a process about once a week. We build the database of templates, and then we use that single template for a couple of weeks. Alrighty, so these are some of those that look like that ac.cc, com.ki, tk, com.tk, vu, hco.is, etc, etc, etc. Kidoki. 
All right, and so by the end of that process, we're going to end up with um, all the DNS domains that we can possibly find on the internet um, that have a relationship with the, with the target that we originally set out for. And now we can actually start the fingerprinting process and, um, and start going through the DNS lookups, etc., 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 in the hope of actually getting our IP addresses. And maybe just talk about that very quickly. We've got about five minutes. Um, getting the IP address, the addresses, once we've got the domains, is relatively simple. Uh, we try DNS zone transfers. Uh, we look at uh, DNS forward lookups, DNS forward uh, brute forcing, at least. Essentially what that means is we just look for common names in a given DNS domain space. So we say, is there a www.domain? Is there a mail.domain? Is there a popfree.domain? Is there a server1.domain? And whenever we find a name like that, we record the IP address. And we look at the NS records, we look at the NS records, etc., etc. When we get entries that match, all right, so whenever I get an IP address that matches a specific name, what I then do is I take that IP address, I expand it to a class C block, and I then do a reverse walk through that class C block. Essentially what the reverse walk is, is that I do a DNS lookup of the first IP address in that block and see if it's got a name. I then do a DNS lookup of the second IP address in that block, see if it's got a name. and I start the process from scratch. Then I go about trying to identify the boundaries of those networks. Uh, the one tool I can use for that is Whois. As you know, there's three Whois registrars. There's Wright, there's Aaron, and there's Apnic. Right? Um, uh, Aaron, which handles DNS, uh, not DNS, but IP, IP name registrations in the States, is relatively inaccurate, doesn't give a lot of information. But Apnic and, uh, Apnic and Wright tell you almost exactly where IP blocks start and where they stop. We use um, uh, routing entries by looking at the core routers on the internet. There's sites like um, digix.net that allow you to do that graphically. So we know exactly this is the block that's being routed. Um, we do DNS reverse walks. So what we can do there is we can say, well, let's do a reverse lookup through an entire space and see where the names are grouped. Now, if the names are all grouped in the front, we say that front part of the block is what belongs to the target. If the names are all spread out, then we can say the entire block belongs to the target. And finally, we've been looking at a, a trace route technique that we call TTL prediction. And you know how trace route normally works, right? Uh, you send out a UDP packet, and the first with a certain time to live, I'd say time to live of one. The first routing that it gets decrements the time to live, has a time to live of zero, and it sends you an ICMP packet saying uh, TTL expired. Right? Then you send out a second UDP packet with a TTL of two. Right, it goes past the first router, hits the second router, at that point the TTL is expired, and the second router sends you an ICMP packet saying TTL is expired. And that's how your trace route, client, trace route client can then map out from the first IP address, the first hop all the way down to the eventual target. Um, the problem with doing that over a lot of IP addresses is that it takes very, very long. If there's um, 16 hops between me and the subnet that I want to trace route to, then I'm going to end up with having to spend 16 times however many hops there are packets and wait for 16 times I have any hops out of the price. So the technique that we've been playing with is that we say, well, let's do one trace route to the target network, right, and let's calculate what the TTL is. Say it's, um, or how many hops there are, say there's 16. Then what we do is we set our TTL to two past the number of hops, and we send out a packet. And if it's different, if the response to that, the ICMP TTL expired is different to the first one, then we know we've got a different route. Um, if it's the same, we come back again, and then we come back again. So instead of having to trace out, where it can maybe take 16 packets, we trace back, we only have to send out two packets. And we can do that much, much faster now, and so it's possible for us to take, say, an entire class C, and do a trace route to every single IP address, and see where the routing entries differ. Right, and where those routing entries differ between one IP and a different IP, that obviously designates a, a subnetting of that, of that space. So we can start to draw, delineate the boundaries. And we can now do that with these tools, we can now do it very accurately. All right, some of the things we're doing, uh, we're trying to write these processes so they're multi-threaded. Um, obviously, a lot of these things take a lot of time. So if I have to kick off, say, 256 trace routes or 254 DNS lookups, it takes a very long time. If I can send out 254 at the same time, I'm um, using multi-threading technologies, obviously I can make it a lot quicker. And similarly, we can do some of these things asynchronous. 
So instead of sending out a DNS request and waiting for the response, sending out another DNS request and waiting for the response, I can have one process sending out 254 DNS requests all at the same time, and I can have another process slowly collecting the responses as they come back. Um, I can even put those processes on different machines to optimize, to optimize my hardware. And with these kinds of techniques, like I say, we've reduced the time required to go through some of these processes from literally where we used to do it a year ago by hand and it would take us two weeks to where we can now do it and it takes us, say, two hours. And not only is it, uh, is it that much faster, but it's also much, much more accurate. And that is that. We're just on time. Uh, that's all I have to say. Are there any questions? Oh, we've covered a lot. If I'm single. <laughs> Thank you for the question at the back. So, how many machines do you have called for this process to check out the big white black? What sort of equipment are those yours? Um, we, well, for the name of Packet, we, we have one server that we host um, here in the States that's got, that we push, I think we push about uh, 30 gigs a month through it. We're doing just this. Um, we have two other servers that we would use in different parts of the world um, if we're doing it on a big space. The Black Hat is a relatively small space. So yeah, it's, it's, it's massive. The amount of bandwidth is, um, that we use up is, is really, really huge. And what it takes up the most is the, is the website, um, website copy. You can imagine it's just, it's just huge. We suck bandwidth. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 No, at this stage we're still doing a lot of manual verification, um, and there's a lot of stuff that we're still missing, that you really just pain miss, because um, because the assumptions that we make in these processes for that space just isn't valid. Um, for example, you'll find a, a big financial institution buying up specialist financial companies. So um, that example that I gave of uh, TrustBank.com having an insurance company called, um, called TrustInsurance.co.za and having a link to their site. But what you often find is that TrustBank.com actually owns a specialist financial consulting group in London called um, BransonAndSons.co.uk and there's no linking. Now, there's no linking. There's, there's nothing that says um, on the web page or anything that Trust Bank owns Branson and Sons. The only way you pick it up is, for example, if you read through Trust Bank's website, looked at all the press releases, you'll see in May 1997 they made a press release saying uh, Trust Bank purchases Branson and Sons specialist uh, financial services company, and that's it. And there's no way to pick it up. first, do that sort of old school intelligence gathering that you need to do, extract a list of core domains, and if your list of core domains is uh, comprehensive enough, then this process is really good for picking up the non-obvious relationships, the stuff that you wouldn't pick up with your eye. So that would be part of the initial process of building that core list of, um, of sites that we, would, that we would put in. So it's been a, I probably spent, I guess in a big space, I probably spent two days just surfing, finding out who the guys are, reading their financial statements, reading their press releases. I really like to read press releases. Um, and the other thing we do in, in the space where we operate, it's not easy to do that globally, but like if you're working in South Africa or you're working in a specific city, is I speak to people. So I'll find guys that I know that know the industry, and then they'll say, so then, you know, what is the relationship between Sunlum and Old Mutual? And they'll say, oh yeah, Sunlum and Old Mutual both used to outsource their IT infrastructure to um, Unisys. And so if you see that the guys are using the same IP addresses, that's because all their stuff previously used to be owned by Unisys, but now they're managing it separately. And so you can start to understand those more complex relationships. Yeah. I, I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we can do that automatically. Tricky. Any questions? Oh, yeah. You find that uh, when you go into companies, mycompany.com, for example, do you find that they are, are they are not aware that they actually are struggling with mycompany.co.uk or mycompany.com? 
sort of that in they they're like this you are as going into the consultant. Uh, the question is, the, the company, don't they know this up front? In other words, do, when, if I tell them they've got strong links with my company, but XYZ, um, do they not know that already? And the answer is, yeah, you'd be surprised how little guys know. You'd be amazed. Um, I've, I've almost never, because what we do when we go through assessment, when we finish this process, we take that list of domains, submit and IP addresses to the customer, and we say, this is what we think the footprint is, this is what we want to attack, is that okay? And I've almost never been in this scenario where a guy says to me, oh, yeah, it's not bad, but you actually missed this. Um, I've almost always been where the guy says, no, that's not ours. And I go, uh, yes, it is. No, no, that's not ours. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, and it's easy to, when you look at the numbers, it's easy, it's easy to see why. If you take a, a, a big pharmaceutical, for example, big pharmaceutical has their own brand, they have all the different derivations of the brand, they have all their company brand, all their country brands, right, so their .co, the .uk's, and their .ie's, and their .de's, and things like that, and then they've got all their product brands also. So for every, um, for every product that these guys bring up, for every different kind of medicine, every little tablet, somebody goes off and registers a domain and builds a website. And the security officer doesn't know that. He doesn't know that the um, uh, AIDS research department of the pharmaceutical have got a, we've got a program where they do XYZ surveys and they've registered a site for it. Um, so yeah, mo most of the time we're able to find things out that the guys didn't know themselves. Uh, the question was whether we're, whether we're planning to use uh, the Google APIs. It's an application program interface that uh, Google has made available, fully available, and to maybe look at the Google groups um, to see where you guys are posting from and stuff. It's a very interesting idea. Yeah, we are planning to look at it. In fact, we're looking at it already. Uh, what we've decided at this point, though, is not to use the APIs um, because they don't appear to be working that well yet. But we can do most of that um, manually by crafting our own HTTP calls. To the, web, to the web service. We're keeping a close, close eye on the Google APIs. Um, and that thing worries us a little about the Google APIs is we're not sure where they're going to go commercially. So it may be that we build a whole set of tools um, around the APIs and then find that next year we have to pay a million dollars for them if you want to carry them using them. So we're a little bit, um, a little bit nervous about doing it that way. Anything else? Hi, man. <laughs> All right, it's um, 25 past. Thank you very much for your time. Um, we value you being here. Thank you. Thank you.